ערב טוב, ערב טוב ירושלים! <אח> ברוכים הבאים למפגש פסקה חד פעמי וראשון מסוגו בישראל בין ג'ורדן פיטרסון ובן שפירו אני רותם סלע, מול סלע מאיר ומול משותף בהוצאת שיבולת, אותה אנחנו מוציאים לאור עם שותפינו מקרן תקווה. <אז> תודה רבה, ובערב לא רגיל זה, שמתקיים באופן לא מקרי, לבקשת המשתתפים, דווקא בירושלים, נדון בעתידה של החירות האנושית בעידן בו היא לא ברורה מאליה. אז אני רוצה להודות לכם קודם כל שבאתם. המהירות, תודה לכם, כן? מגיע לכם. המהירות שבה נחטפו שלושת אלפים כרטיסים לאירוע הזה, שיכל באותה קלות למלא אולם של עשרת אלפים או עשרים אלף איש, מוכיחים שיש סיבה לאופטימיות, שיש צמא אדיר לדיון פתוח ולא מתנצל במשמעות ובמהות, וגם שאנחנו יודעים להעריך ולהוקיר אנשים שמקדישים את חייהם למלחמה על האמת או לפחות על הזכות לדון בה ללא מורא. <אז> ג'ורדן ובן כמובן. <אז> אני מוציא לאור אז אני חייב גם לעשות את זה על הכיסאות שלכם יש את הדבר הזה ומי מכם שלא שייך עדיין לקהילת הספר והשיח שלנו שהיא אחת מהמארגנות של האירוע הזה אני מזמין אתכם בסוף האירוע להצטרף ולשנה אחת לשיבולת ועכשיו אני רוצה להזמין את חברי ואת שותפי ואת האדם שאחראי יותר מכל ישראלי אחר להתחדשות הרעיונית של הציבור הלאומי והליברלי בישראל וגם לערב הזה את עמיעד כהן, מנכ"ל קרן תקווה. עמיעד ערב טוב ירושלים! <אז> תודה רבה לכם ואני אעבור לאנגלית כי בסוף האירוע הזה מתקיים באנגלית. Thank you רותם and thank you all. Let me start by saying as a part of our mission in Tikva we are thrilled to host today two of the most influential and important intellectuals on the world stage today. Two people who are shaping destiny of the Western civilization, leading a successful avant-garde, pushback against barbarians who try to roll back modernity, human dignity, and civility. I want to thank Dr. Peterson and Ben Shapiro for their friendship and for joining us tonight here in Jerusalem. I also want to extend special thanks to the teams that made this event happen, whether the Daily Wire, in Dr. Peterson's office, or our incredible team in the Tikva Fund and the Selameir team. They should get applause. I couldn't have thought of a better kickoff of the new year with three of our greatest minds speaking about preserving liberty in the cradle of Western civilization. I hope this festive event, in this special point in time, in the eve of the Hebrew New Year, and in this special place, will spark a new conversation and a new beginning for a better and healthier discourse. When Dr. Gadi Taub wrote his book, yes, he should get too, a book that in Hebrew is called the Merit HaShafuf, a book explaining what postmodernism is in the midst of the 90s, some time ago, few understood what he was talking about. 
But a good intellectual is measured by his ability to understand one thing and understand what's the silver bullet that will change the future. To identify decisive trends. In his book, last year that was published, Nayadim V'Nayichim, The Somewheres and Anywheres, Gadi Taub put his finger on exactly another current decisive trend. Against a worldview that abolishes national identity, dismantles the institutions of the family, and ignores the divine, and ignores the moral standard. A conservative, he articulates a conservative worldview that calls for a life that includes a stable family, a community, and a national identity. The conservative worldview stands for a commitment to a system of moral rules that does not just go with the flow of today's standards. Just like back then, we should pay attention to the things Gadi says today. I want to invite Gadi Taub, Gadi Taub for his open remarks. Thank you very much. כמעט הצליחו לשים עליי עניבה, זה עוד לא קרה. רק תקווה יכולים לארגן אירוע כזה, וזה תענוג להיות פה, ותענוג להיות עם קהל כזה, ולהרגיש את האנרגיה. וגם אני איעזר בדפים ברשותכם, כי הטלפרומטר הוא במרחק לא מתאים למשקפיים שלי. We used to think it was self-evident that adherence to the idea of universal human rights will promote and secure liberty. But this is no longer the case. In fact, the opposite is true. In one of the most staggering dialectical inversions of ideas, human rights are now being weaponized against liberty. They have become a means to undermine democracy, thus removing the linchpin of liberty, our right to be citizens, partaking in sovereignty rather than passive administered subjects. The first to notice how the ideology of human rights has turned into an assault on democratic sovereignty was John Fonte, first in a 2002 essay on the Durban conference that took place one year previously, then in a book that was, tight, that was little noticed and quickly forgotten, though it was Fonte who was right, and whereas Fukuyama, whom we never forget, was wrong. Fonte's book is called Sovereignty and Submission. Will Americans rule themselves or be ruled by others? Its first, chap its first chapter begins like this. A news story from the beginning of the 21st century offered a glimpse of world politics in the future. On October 27, 2000, Reuters reported that 47 prominent American human rights and civil rights activists had sent a petition labeled a call to action to the United Nations to Mary Robinson, the UN's High Commissioner for Human Rights, in preparation for the World Conference Against Racism, Racial Discrimination, Xenophobia, and Related Intolerance to be held in Durban, South Africa, the following year. The call to action declared that although segregation has ended, persons of color in the United States of America continue to face pervasive and persistent patterns of racial discrimination and bias that threaten their livelihood, their liberty, and even their lives. It further stated that racial discrimination in the United States is particularly, particularly pernicious and endemic within the US criminal justice system. The document charged that government, the government of the United States of America has not upheld its obligation to eliminate discrimination in all its forms despite the US ratification of the UN Convention of the on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination. The signatories called on the UN to take action and force America to amend its ways. What is notable about all this, Fonte observed, is that the signatories who failed to convince their fellow countrymen to vote for their agenda sought a way to force them to accept it. They also demanded that the US remove its restrictions from the acceptance of the treaty, one of which 
was that the implementation of treaty provisions will be subordinate to the Constitution of the United States. Whenever America signs any international treaty, one of the caveats is that it would be the implementation is subordinate to the Constitution of the United States. What all this means is that for these activists, there is a higher authority than the will of the people, than the consent of the governed, as expressed in a democratically ratified constitution. And that authority is human rights, which are universal and absolute, grounded in nature and not in society, and that therefore should be enforced by a universal transnational regime that can override the governments of nation states and their democratic mechanisms. Since Fonte first sounded the alarm, the globalist form of anti-democratic liberalism, this is the name I, I gave it in my book, has advanced. It has made inroads into national judiciaries. It has almost demolished immigration policy in the EU, the US, and Israel. And it created global forums to address global warming, the COVID-19 pandemic, and world economy. But Fonte's warnings went unheeded. After the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989, a triumphant, even complacent mood settled in the West. Fukuyama declared the end of history based on the assumption that liberal democracy had proved to be the optimal political arrangement and that all humanity would eventually realize that. Liberal democracy is not perfect, nor is it exciting, but it has proved, Fukuyama thought, to be the best way to foster, foster peace and prosperity. It was the destination of history, no less, and that history needed no cunning. It could make do with common sense. Fukuyama's most influential disciple was Bill Clinton, who opened the door for China to enter the World Trade Organization. Fukuyama's analysis was a good expression of a mood, but not a good analysis of political reality. The mood was widespread. It went well beyond those who debated Fukuyama in political science departments. Almost the whole of academia felt that our comfortable way of life in the West, and in Israel too, our freedom can be taken for granted, and we can now turn our attention to such luxury activities as atonement for our sins, rituals of purifying our conscience. This is how we got moral grandstanding as a substitute for serious reflection. Edward Said, not Fukuyama, became the intellectual hero of a generation that thought it was so secure that it could indulge in moral narcissism masquerading as academic research. And Said's disciple, disciples, the most influential of which was Barack Obama, would turn the obsession with making ritual amends with guilt feelings into a policy. As Henry Kissinger has remarked after Obama's 2009 Cairo speech, apology cannot be a superpowers policy. That is bound to end badly, and not surprisingly, it did. It ended with appeasement towards Putin's Russia in a policy foolishly dubbed reset, and was even worse with the JCPOA, known more popularly as the Iran nuclear deal, that the Biden administration is attempting to resurrect, supplying economic oxygen to the mullah of Te mullahs of Tehran, even as they brutally butcher their own citizens, now bravely protesting the rights of women. <laughs> Power to them, indeed. The, the disciples of Fukuyama and Said did not see the possibility of a new threat like China because they could not, Im they could not imagine that a form, of capital, a form of capitalism could coexist with totalitarian control. The West just assumed that, that capitalism and a free world market will make China liberal and well disposed towards a fiction called the international community. The West made a similar mistake regarding Russia because it could not imagine that socialism would be replaced by a kleptocracy, not a liberal free market democracy. Fukuyama also didn't see the, the tenacity of political Islam because fundamentalism has become almost incomprehensible to the Western mind, especially the American mind. Obama and his heirs thought that skin in the game coupled with a deep apology for post-colonial sins will cool the rage of the mullahs, rage which must be somehow our fault. But what was even further from Fukuyama's mind was a challenge from within. He never imagined that the disciples of 
Edward Said and their assault on identities would join hands with a new anti-democratic form of globalist liberalism. And these two together would finally form a homegrown assault on liberal democracies. Since Fonte published his book in 2011, it has become obvious that this problem is not going away anytime soon. We have seen witness the same struggle here in Israel, in the, UA, in the EU, and in the US. The issues are mostly the same. Activist judiciaries employ the so-called international law. Illegal immigration is defended in the name of universal human rights. NGOs summon external influence on nation states and transnational institutions enact policies that force the hands of democracies. Think not only of the UN and EU, but also of the International Criminal Court, the International Monetary Fund, the World Health Organization, etc. My own book attempted to document these uh, phenomena using mostly the case of Israel, which I think is instructive, since we are often considered the paradigmatic nation state. But I want to finish by pointing out a specifically Jewish issue. Anti-Semitism, too, is now conveyed astonishingly in the language of human rights by making Jewish national identity the one illegitimate national identity, by claiming Israel itself is an apartheid, the language of human rights is made to say that only one people, the Jews, have no right to self-determination. That should complete the picture by ending where we started, the Durban Conference. An orgy of anti-Semitism could not possibly choose a more Orwellian name, the World Conference Against Racism, ra a Racial Discrimination, Xenophobia, and Related Intolerance. And, and this makes it hard for us, because who is against human rights? But if you survey the uh, Israeli scene, almost any NGO which has the phrase human rights in it is in some form anti-Semitic. And so we have to start being self-confident and bold and stand up to these people and call them by name. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I hope all of you know it about that already, but Gadi is the most important voices in the intellectual conservative thriving movement in Israel today. It is very easy to talk about freedom, but it's not so easy to live a life of freedom. Certainly not within the world of American media, a world where the truth is so stable, it changes every five minutes. Ben Shapiro, not so known for his stable opinions, has managed to build a media empire that gives hope that the U.S. might be one day what we all want it to be, a place where the freedom to initiate, to create, and to thrive is found in all areas of life. I'm happy and proud to invite to the stage the most eloquent speaker of the conservative movement in the United States of America, if not the world, my friend Ben Shapiro, please. Thank you so much. Thank you. Toda raba. Ani kol kach sameach liyot kam itchem biel hakodesh yerushalayim. Before I get started, a quick note. Some of you may have come to Tel Aviv to see me a couple of months ago, and uh, I know a lot of people are wondering about the beard. And uh, the answer is, I finally hit puberty. <laughs> it's 
So welcome to my bar mitzvah. Uh, t tonight, I want to talk about the importance of Jerusalem of Yerushalayim. Not merely the city of Jerusalem, Yer HaKodesh, Yer Zahav, the center of the spiritual universe, but the concepts that sprang from Jerusalem and that have shaped the world we all live in, whether we believe in the God of the Bible or whether we don't. The modern world likes to think of itself as rooted in reason, and our pseudo-intellectuals pseudo like to think of reason as completely separate from religious principle. Their basic idea seems to be that religion inhibits thought, that religion enshrines the traditional at the cost of the creative, that it disparages science, that it re-enshrines bigotry, as we hear all the time about the Bible and people who believe in the Bible. This has been the lie at the center of nearly every, every modern revolutionary movement since the French Revolution. That the triumph of religion means a dark age. That abolition of religion means the full flowering of humanity. That raising, that destroying Jerusalem will lead to a better world. As we'll discuss in a few minutes, precisely the opposite is true. But to understand just why humanity liberated from religious principle ends in concentration camps, we have to first understand what Jerusalem brought to the world in the first place. In approximately 1313 BCE, according to traditional biblical belief, God spoke to the Jewish people at Mount Sinai, at Har Sinai. He spoke from the smoke and the sound of the shofar, and he declared fundamental truths that are unreachable by reason alone. Those fundamental truths were essentially three. First, the Torah claimed that God was one, was unified. Second, the Torah claimed that human beings would be held to a standard of morality. Morality springing from God's will, not from our own ideas of what is moral, and that we have the ability to choose how we act because we are made in God's image. And finally, the Torah claimed that God chose a particular nation with which to show the world's universal values, and that the history of that nation would exemplify the progress of humanity. Let's address each of the Torah's contentions in turn. First, the Torah argues that God is one. Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. This was a radical sea change from the pagan belief systems that preceded the Bible. Those pagan belief systems contended that multiple gods ruled an utterly chaotic universe. Now, this explanation of the universe was both politically advantageous and also explanatory. It was politically advantageous because it allowed pagan cultures to merely integrate new gods into the religious superstructure. Right? If you're the Greeks or you're the Romans, you come along, you find a new god, and suddenly that becomes part of your pantheon. It allows you to absorb other peoples. And it was explanatory because it answered the question as to why the world seems so confusing. Right? If the world is a reasonable place, why is everything so chaotic? The Torah rejected all of this. The Torah argued that there is one God. The first of the Ten Commandments was simple and direct. I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. God was the first and the last, the creator. What's more, God's singularity meant that intolerance for untruth had to be pursued. Paganism promoted tolerance and diversity above truth. The Torah argued that truth must triumph, that there is one truth, and that God represents the highest truth. What's more, the Torah argued that God rules over a universe governed by his will, his singular will, a prime mover, a singular God instead of myriad gods, a panoply of gods, would require that logic governs the universe, a predictable set of rules discernible by the human mind. And indeed, that is the precise claim of the Torah. Lo bashamayim he, it's not in the heavens, it's here for us to learn and for us to discover. The universe isn't random, the rules are generally understandable. The Bible isn't just a set of stories designed to explain why the rain falls and the sun shines. Instead, the Bible lays forth for the first time an argument for the internal logic of the universe. God created that universe step by step. He governs that universe in a fashion we can investigate. In Bereshit, in Genesis, the patriarch Abraham, Abraham, asks God to abide by his own rules for right and wrong, for example. When God says that he wants to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham argues with God over right and wrong. He asks God whether collective punishment is appropriate if there are still good people living in the city. And God answers him. God answers him. God doesn't merely ignore Abraham or silence him. Instead, God engages with man. In a chaotic world with no master moral values, the story of Abraham makes no sense. Now, Judaism doesn't claim that we're capable of understanding all of God's motives or actions. We can't understand all of the rules. In Exodus, Moses specifically asks God to show him his face, and God refuses, saying, you can't see my face, for no one can see my face and live. This metaphor is God's way of saying that we humans cannot completely understand God. But God does have a standard, even if we can't fully comprehend it. Right? God's answer is that he's going to walk in front of Moses, and Moses will be able to see his back. He'll be able to see the knot of his tefillin in the Talmud. 
God doesn't randomly change his standards. He is the rock, his ways are perfect, all his ways are just, a faithful God who does no wrong, upright and just is he. The notion of a moral universe is a Judaic creation. It's woven into the name of Israel itself. Yisrael, of course, means struggle with God. And God wants human beings to struggle with him because that is our task on earth, to try and understand God's moral standard and then enact it. Second, we know from the Torah that God demands that we act morally, that we have the ability to choose because we're created in God's image and God is inherently creative. Before the Bible, man was cosmic chattel, a speck, brooded about by the forces of the divine. The gods didn't expect much of man beyond simple bribery. Every so often, burn an animal carcass, and that was pretty much as good as it was going to get. There was no linkage between what we would deem moral behavior and divine expectation. The gods were arbitrary. They were not chained to rules. Human behavior wasn't tied to divine behavior. The Bible offered a different perspective. A singular god meant a singular standard for behavior. Consequences were supposed to be life lessons, meant to teach us to be moral. Sin had consequences, and by the way, does have consequences, in the real world. Now, that didn't mean that every sin would be punished with prompt and proportional consequence, because God doesn't play whack-a-mole with human sin. But it does mean that following God's commandments would usually lead to better life results than doing the opposite. Polytheism argued that the gods were holy, and thus human beings ought to serve them. Judaism argued that we ought to be holy in imitation of God. And Judaism argued that we had the ability to choose to be holy. Polytheism had little notion of the value of individual human beings. This wasn't true for the rulers in polytheistic cultures who were ranked among the gods themselves. You look back to basically any ancient country, from Egypt to Mesopotamia to Rome. If you look at any of them, the leaders were the people who mattered. They were made in the image of God. Literally, they would say this in all of their writings. Epic heroes of the ancient myths are identified with the gods. Commoners never even appear in the narratives. The Torah fought the notion of human inequality before God tooth and nail. We are all created equal before God in our endowment with a certain level of free will. Perhaps most importantly, the sentence, the most important sentence in human history was this from Bereshit Aleph Kavzayin, right? Genesis 1.27, God created man in his image, in the image of God he created him, male and female he created them. Instead of a ruling caste with the power of free will, now all human beings, each and every one of us, was granted the value of choice. God stamped us all, breathed life into all of us, formed us out of the clay, out of the ground. The creation story itself is designed to demonstrate how the first man, Adam, used his innate power of choice wrongly, and we are all Adam's descendants. One of the most moving segments of the Bible takes place just before Cain slays his brother Abel. God sees that Cain is jealous that Abel's offering has already been accepted. And God passionately informs Cain, why are you annoyed? Why has your countenance fallen? Is it not so that if you improve, it will be forgiven you? If you do not improve, however, sin lies at the entrance and it longs for you, but you can rule over it. There's a constant recurring theme in the Chumash. God lays out the importance of choice, of proper exercise, of free will. He says in Dvarim, see, I set before you today life and prosperity, death and destruction. I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him, to keep his commands, decrees, and laws. Now choose life so that you and your children may live. Because we choose, we are God's partners in creation. We're signatories to a covenant with God in which we have to play our role and choose to abide by our commitments. And free choice is the central element. When God brought the Jews out of Egypt and stood them before Sinai, he required them to sign on to the program. And they made an affirmative decision to contract with God, and they did so without even waiting to hear the terms. Now, a seven, Ishmael, we will do and we will hear. Freely willed action even preceded justification. The third lesson of the Torah is that history progresses. And the Torah uses the people of Israel as an example of that divine presence in history. Now, history in a lot of cultures has no beginning and no end. Greek thought saw the universe as permanent and moving in circular fashion. History would recur, and then it would grow, and then it would decay, and then recur, and grow, and decay. There could be no vision of a progression in history and an exorable movement toward a better time or a messianic era. Progress itself was, for many of the ancients, an illusion. Or not even that. It was an idea that had no place in the rational universe. And that view of history was not unique to the Greeks. It was true of the ancient Babylonians, Native American cultures, Hinduism, Buddhism. The Bible takes a fundamentally different view. The Bible immediately sets God in the context of a time-bound history. God, of course, exists outside of time, but he's intimately involved in creating progress. The Jewish creation story notes that God intervenes day by day to create new levels of complexity in the material world, and then he rests. When God intervenes in the world, it is to better the lot of mankind or to teach lessons. God inserts himself in history by preserving Noah and his family. He restrains himself from stopping history ever again by destroying his creatures, no matter their choices. God manifests himself to Abraham to send the first monotheist on a journey to a place Abraham doesn't know. And God then makes a covenant with Abraham to build him up into a great and mighty nation connected with a particular parcel of land, Eretz Yisrael.
God chooses Abraham. He chooses Isaac. He chooses Jacob. And then he chooses the people of Israel to act as exemplars of morality across history, to spread his word with Moses as his prophet. God says, you are to be holy to me because I, the Lord, am holy, and I have set you apart from the nations to be my own. The story of history is the story of God's romance with his chosen nation, his decision to take that nation out of slavery and bring it forth into freedom, to use that nation as a vehicle for the transmission of his message. God says, has any God ever tried to take for himself one nation out of another nation by signs and by wonders, by war, by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, or by great and awesome deeds like all the things the Lord your God did for you in Egypt before your very eyes? But, of course, history isn't linear. The plot has twists and turns. The story of humanity is the story of the romance between an honorable God and a straying nation, a nation that knows better but has to learn and relearn to love God once more, and a God who occasionally hides his face but waits patiently for his people to return to him. With each relearning comes progress, a movement toward that historical finish line. We are all part of the great drama of history. History gives us a place. It gives us a rationale. We may live as individuals, but we're part of the tapestry of time, the great chain of history. And even if our thread comes to an inglorious end, God weaves with us. History, in short, can progress. It can progress because God cares about us as individuals and because he's invested in our history. And the Torah argues that the, ulti the eventual culmination of history will come with a universal recognition of God and his handiwork, with the Jews as the treasure jewel shining forth light from Jerusalem, from this city. These three arguments have created the modern world because God is one. The universe is worth exploring and investigating, and our minds mirror God's to the extent that we can discover many of his laws. In this basic principle lies the root of science. Because God gave us free will and demands of us morality, we have to pursue virtue within the context of freedom. Tyranny is an imposition on our individuality, but libertinism, the perversion of liberty, is a betrayal of our holiness. The notion of ordered liberty began at Sinai. Because God tells us that history progresses and that progress is possible, he demands of us that we pursue it. And because God chooses a people as his example, he tells us we have to understand that progress can be achieved in a number of ways, with respect for those of other nations and cultures, and in understanding that there are certain moral values that stand above all of us. The roots of international order begin with the morally justified nation, not with a cadre of experts who sit atop some sort of international institution and tell us all what to do. Now, we are in the process, unfortunately, in the West of caricaturing the Bible, of mocking it, of forgetting it. The root text of the West is being abandoned in favor of a sort of free-floating rationalism, this idea that we can come up with anything out of our minds. Without the premises of Sinai, that rationalism collapses in on itself like a dying star. After all, what good does reason do in a godless, reasonless, purposeless universe? It's a discussion I frequently had with Sam Harris, who likes to argue that we can simply use our minds and our reason to suss out everything there is to know about the universe. And I've always said to him, I don't understand how he can claim that there's such a thing as absolute truth outside the context of an absolute. If all we are are evolutionarily adaptive creatures, there's nothing there that speaks to the idea of an absolute truth that human beings can grasp. There's what's evolutionarily adaptive and what's evolutionarily not. Rationality without that higher purpose means nothing. What can reason actually accomplish if we aren't so much godly creatures as those evolutionarily adaptive animals incapable of seeking or understanding any higher truths, truths that actually don't exist in any case? What sort of progress is possible when we don't have any common standards of right and wrong? The only progress possible is utopian world breaking, which we saw in the 20th century, or regression back to paganism. Again, the 20th century was the story of rationalism without religion, and it ended in gas chambers and gulags. A world liberated from the premises of the Bible built all of that. After all, progress could not be achieved by adherence to the wisdom of tradition, but by breaking eggs to make omelets. Forget particularism, forget nationality, the world said. Instead, universalism had to triumph through universal application of power. Right? One nation or another would dominate all the others. Hundreds of millions of people died for these ideas. Our century is the story of the latter problem, the regression back to paganism. We are reverting to tolerant lies promoted by self-appointed kings who soar above the restrictions of other human beings. Human beings aren't made in the image of God, only the experts are made in the image of God. We don't have free will, only they have free will. There's no such thing as an absolute truth, there is only what the experts tell us. We have returned to an era when gods ruled us from above, not through rules, not through reason, not even through explaining themselves, but through sheer power, when chaos was the order of the day. Now, can we truly argue that we as a society are better off now that we've abandoned Jerusalem? Is our society 
a society that currently argues in the West that men can be women, that inequality of results automatically means discrimination, that evil terrorist groups and moral armies are engaged in cycles of violence, is this a truly better or more moral society? The answer, of course, is no. We must return to Jerusalem. We must never forget Jerusalem. For so long as it remains in our hearts, so will the God in whose image we were created. In the words of Isaiah, Ki mitzion tetze Torah udvar Hashem mi Yerushalayim, the Torah will come forth from Zion and the word of God from Yerushalayim. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Beth. Thank you very much. I still remember the day in late 2017, early 2018, sitting in an airport and listening and watching on my cell phone Jordan Peterson's interview in Channel 4. Do you remember that? From that very moment, I started to spend hours watching dozens of Jordan Peterson's videos and lectures, going back as far as I could. In one of his lectures, when he was asked, what is the alternative for the argument of human rights, of entitlements, we call it in Hebrew, what are you offering instead of it? And Peterson's doctor, Jordan Peterson, stood on stage with his like stature and said, we have an alternative. You should, conservatives, should argue for responsibility. Taking responsibility is the most important decision in a person's life. Unfortunately, it is the most uncommon decision. Yet, it is in the same time the most moral decision to take. Yesterday, on the holiest day of the Jewish people, on Yom Kippur, we stood up as individuals and we took responsibility for our actions. We took responsibility for our, for our actions as individuals and as a nation. On Yom Kippur, we do not only take responsibility for the past on things we did in the past, but we express our commitment to the future. And this commitment is how we conservatives want to make a real difference in the world. I beat on my own chest, not on other people's chests. I'm honored to invite to the stage the person, together with Ben Shapiro, but Jordan Peterson did it to me personally, that has the ability to articulate what I feel, but I lack the words. And he gives me the words and the expressions and exactly the phrases that I say, hey, how did I, how can't I express myself like that? He changes the next generation, a worldwide generation on one thing, how to take responsibility for their own lives. I hope that you made your bed this morning. Dr. Jordan Peterson. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you. Well, so thank you, thank you. The feeling is mutual, really. Okay, so I thought I would talk about <clears throat> three things tonight responding to the previous two speakers. I'd like to talk about stories. I'd like to talk about unity. And I'd like to talk about responsibility. I'll talk about responsibility in relationship to something like sacrifice. So let's start by talking about stories. So I think the most fundamental discovery of the last 75 years on the cognitive perceptual front, and, and that would include, in some strange way, the domain of literary analysis, including postmodernism and also artificial intelligence, uh, the, the, the construction of autonomous robots, which you may notice aren't here yet. Um, there's, there's, there's been a convergence of both investigation and conclusion on those fronts, I would say in some sense because all of those disciplines ran into the same problem head on, at pretty much at the same time. And that was something like the problem of perception. And the problem of perception is a very deep problem. And it's a problem that undermines the objectives of pure, of both pure rationalism and pure empiricism. And, and so you'd say in some sense it undermines the claim to totality that's part and parcel of the of an overextended scientific enterprise. The problem is this, the world appears to be too complex to perceive. And so, if you look at any even single object, although it appears to you as a unity, if you analyze it in its totality, it's composed of a multitude or even an infinite of subsidiary unities and it's in a context of an equal number of unities above and beyond it in almost an infinite array. In, in short, there's almost an infinite number of ways to perceive a particular object. Now, it, it seems self-evident to us because all we have to do is look at the world and there the objects are, but you have to understand that a huge part of your unconscious cognitive processing is devoted, will concentrate on visual perception, to visual perception. It's a very neurologically intensive process. So part of the way that you solve that on the visual front, because it's particularly intensive visually, is that you only have a very small part of your visual field that's high resolution. It's called the fovea. And each cell in the fovea is connected to 10,000 cells in the primary visual cortex, and each of those to 10,000 more cells. And that kind of exponential increase adds up to a very large number of cells. So if you wanted all your vision to be as intensely high resolution as the center point of your vision, which is what you point at the world constantly, bit by bit, partly unconsciously when things attract your attention, and partly consciously when you direct your attention. If, you, if your whole visual field was as intensely high resolution as your fova, you'd have to have a head, head like a space alien just to keep all the brain uh, functional. And so, I could imagine doing something, imagine that you were trying to paint a photorealistic representation of a single cup and a flower on a table. You think of all the hours you'd have to spend doing that, capturing, say, all the reflections in the, in the glass, in the, in the cup, all the subtle play of light, and how that would transform across the day, too, so you'd have to stabilize the lighting, you'd have to stabilize the conditions exactly so that that object would remain constant enough so you could attend to it for the hours or dozens of hours or weeks or even months that it would take to portray it in all of its detail. Because everything is singular in some real sense as well as universal, and so the problem of perception is a major problem. And it's associated with this problem of a plenitude of underlying facts. We should let the facts guide us. No problem. Which facts? Oh yeah, that's a problem. 
because there's an infinite number of facts. It's not just a little problem, it's a big problem. And so when robotics engineers started to design systems that could act in the world, they had to, they started to design systems that could perceive the world and then they found out that that was just impossible. They had absolutely 100% no idea how to crack that because all the obvious boundaries between things and all the obvious reasons that objects seem self-evident to us aren't there in any simple sense in the world. Uh, partly it's because we map functional utility onto objects and so we actually don't perceive objects. We perceive meanings and infer objects. And meanings are only relevant to something that's deeply embodied or maybe even something that's alive. Or maybe even something that has a soul, who knows? So when I see this, it's a speaker, and the reason for that is because sound comes out of it and I can hear the sound. And when I perceive that, it's, it's something I can sit on. That's why a beanbag and a stump can both be a chair, despite sharing virtually no objective features in common, apart from the fact they're both made of matter, which isn't really much of a commonality. And so you can sit on a stump and you can sit on a beanbag and therefore they're both chairs and I suppose those tables could be chairs too because you can sit on them. There's a functional element to object perception and it's not secondary. It's not like you see the object and then infer the function because the way your nervous system is set up, the fovea pattern recognition systems map directly onto the motor output systems even before they map onto conscious vision. And so there are people who, have, uh, who are who are blind, who tell you they can't see anything, but if you put up your hand in front of them and you ask them to guess which hand is up, they can guess with 90% accuracy. And they also respond psychophysiologically to flashed faces that show, say, uh, facial expressions associated with anxiety or fear or, or pain. And so they can't see, but their eyes can map the meaningful patterns of the world onto their bodies and our visual systems are complexly layered like that. They map onto us at multiple levels of analysis. And so we have to see the world, we see the world as a meaningful place. We see the world as a meaningful place before we see the world as a world of objects. Now that's something, if it's true, that's something. And then you might ask, well what is the structure of meaning through which we see the world? And that's the next question. What is the structure of meaning through which we see the world? And the answer to that is, that's what a story describes. And that's why we love stories, because seeing the world, seeing the world so we can navigate through it, let's say, seeing the world so that we can make our way forward, we can participate in the ex hodos, the way forward, let's say, means we have to see the world through a story. Now, the postmodernists figured that out, and that's part of why their critique of science is actually quite devastating. Because they did make the claim, in some real sense, that the scientific narrative, the scientific process, has to be nested in an underlying narrative. And that turns out, I would say, to be true. So, two thumbs up, perhaps, to the postmodernists for that discovery. Where they went wrong, and very deadly wrong, and politically wrong and wrong in an intellectually prideful manner, I would say, is they failed to notice the magnitude of the mystery they had discovered, which is, for example, that any given text is susceptible to an infinite number of potential interpretations, which is a postmodern claim, leading to the idea, for example, that it's very, very difficult to assemble anything like a canonical set of books, because if one text is susceptible to a multitude of interpretations, then certainly a canon of texts is susceptible to an even larger multitude of interpretations. And so then you might say, well, which interpretation is canonical, which is the argument of every argument, right? Which text is canonical? That's the core of every argument. If you can't solve that for a paragraph or a single text, how can you solve it for a canon? And the postmodernists allied in some sense with the Marxists, and for many of the same reasons, the desire to bring the margin to the center, let's say, jumped to the conclusion that the narrative that we impose upon the world and always have is one that is nothing but the expression of naked power. Right? We hear that all the time. It's all about power. It's all about power. What's history? Well, it's a power dynamic. It's a power dynamic between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. It's a power dynamic between com competitors in the economic environment. It's all power between men and women. It's all power. 
That's history explained in one term. What's the present like? It's all power. It's all domination. It's all oppression. It's all victimization. It's all naked power. That's convenient for you if you want to express power because if that happens to be the ethos by which you live, then why wouldn't you use power to put yourself forward in the world? If that's the landscape itself, and that's the fundamental Marxist narrative, but not only the Marxist narrative, it's, it's a deeper story than that. I would say Marxism is a branch of the claim that the world, the rule, the proper rule of the world is the spirit of power. And that's wrong. And not only is it wrong... <laughs> not only is it wrong technically, and it is wrong technically, it's also wrong morally. It's wrong technically because those creatures, including non-human creatures, who rely on power to attain, pre to attain prominence or status, do that in a very unstable and inefficient manner. Why unstable? Those who live by the sword die by the sword. And Franz de Waal, who studied behavior in chimpanzees, our closest primate relatives, has showed very cl clearly that the most successful alpha males are not the ones who use dominance and force, but the ones who engage in the most reciprocal activity and are the best at peacemaking. And so, so much for the biological argument. And then on the human front, so we are, there is a subset of people who rely on power to maneuver their way through lives, and those people are called psychopaths. And I'm not kidding, that's exactly, precisely accurate, because for a psychopath, there's nothing but his own narrow, immediate self-interest, and you are there to serve that function, and that's that. And then you might say, well, how successful are psychopaths? And maybe you're cynical, and you say, well, everyone who's successful in business and politics is a psychopath. And then I might say, well, to the degree that you're successful, is that because you're a psychopath? And if it's not true for you, well, maybe it's not true for them either. Now, it is true upon occasion for a small subset of people, and that stabilizes at somewhere between 1 and 5% of populations, biologically speaking, with the mean around 3%. And what seems to happen is that if the number of psychopaths falls below to about 1%, everybody forgets they exist, and they become incautious and allow them to proliferate, and then they can raise up to about 5%, and then everybody starts to see that the psychopaths are coming out of the woodwork, and, you know, hits them back with sticks and then they fall back to 3%. But if 97% of the world, world's population, the world's individuals, are making their way through life on non-psychopathic principles, then there's no way that you can say that psychopathy and the power drive that drives it is a successful strategy. It's not. And so it's not power, so it's wrong technically. Now, Duwall has also shown that chimpanzee males who use power to to dominate their hierarchy are very much likely to, re to meet an extremely violent end and who have very short lives. And if you know anything about the history of tyrants, you might, ex you might derive precisely the same conclusion. Then you might ask yourself as well, if you want to have a successful relationship with your wife and husband, are you going to base that on power? So one of you is a tyrant, one of you is a slave, and that's supposed to be the recipe for a stable, iterating, reciprocal relationship that lasts decades? Good luck. Try it out. See how well it works. If you're a man, you're going to find that women aren't that easy to oppress. And if you're a woman, you're going to find that... If you're an utter tyrant in your feminine way and you demand too much, all you'll do is demoralize your man to the point where you want, won't want to sleep to him with him and that you'll feel that you're in your own special kind of well-deserved hell. And so, it's not the basis for a stable relationship, and that's partly, and this is also extremely important. You imagine that there's, there might be one rule that would govern our interactions if we only had to interact once. And that rule might be, I can dominate and win. I never see you again, I can take everything you have, and that's the end of it. But that's not the world that we live in. The world that we live in is a world of iterated interactions, right? Multiple games played over very long spans of time with many people involved. And so there's an ethos that emerges out of that that's something like an ethos of fair play. And people abide by that, and it's because it's a deep instinct and it's a deep moral calling to be reciprocal, to treat other people as you would like to be treated. And that's a good antidote to the ethos of power. And it's part of a much deeper story, which is a story that I would say the people of Israel originated in large part. And so... <laughs> and so, then let's talk about unity. Um, here's... Here's what unity does psychologically. You're either unified, which means you're pointed in a single direction, and that your attentional priorities are linked towards some 
integrated aim or you're aimless and hopeless and anxious because if you're scattered all over the place because you don't have a central narrative then anxiety emerges to signal the path pa to signal the fact that you have too many competing alternatives in front of you you're disunified consequence negative emotion anxiety in particular which signals entropy which signals disunity so that's a marker of not being unified. What's the other marker? Most of the positive emotion that you, ex you experience, we know this neurophysiologically, most of the positive emotion that you experience that makes life worth living, analgesic positive emotion, anxiolytic positive emotion, the positive emotion that gives you hope and curiosity and drives you forward, that's experienced in relationship to a unified goal. And the higher the goal, the more hope and positive emotion that's experienced as you view yourself making incremental progress towards the goal. So you need a unified goal that's transcendent in order to quell anxiety and to give you hope. And the technical details of that, I would say, are already laid out. So that's, you now, so that's on the individual front. If you're not unified, which means in some sense that you're... The ethos, the spirit that inhabits you is not... Um, uh, is not, it's a plethora of deities rather than a monotheistic structure. If it's a plethora of deities rather than a monotheistic structure, you're anxious and hopeless because you're scattered all over the place. So what happens socially? Well, socially you're either unified or you're not. If you're not unified, then what are you? Well, you might be diverse, possibly, although you can have diversity and unity, which is what happens in a healthy and well-established family. But if you have no unity, Socially, then you have disunity, and if you have disunity socially, well, what do you have? You have confusion and hopelessness, and that degenerates into outright conflict. So without unity, the anxiety levels in this society and the hopelessness levels in this society mount to the point where people are at each other's throat. So no unity, no psychological health, no unity, no social peace and stability. And that's that. And that's why the contribution of the idea of monotheism was such a massive contribution. Because it was an intuition of the idea that all human motivations, all functions of perception, all forms of interaction had to be melded into something that had a transcendent unity that was posited out into the future, that constituted an aim and a, an aim and a psychologically uniting principle and a socially uniting spirit and to the degree that we all abide by that socially unifying spirit then we're sane and peaceful and productive and generous and that's not the ethos of power quite quite the contrary so in, in with regards okay I'll, I'll, I've got one more thing to add to that the story so what's the antithesis to the spirit of power well that's partly what's laid out in the biblical corpus so let's so imagine that there is an a spirit that's antithetical to the spirit of power, maybe the spirit of deceit, maybe the spirit of pride, the catastrophic spirit of dissolution. It's a complex spirit because a transcendent unity has to unite everything and something that unites everything is very difficult to apprehend as a unity. And so what the biblical corpus does is it aggregates a set of micro stories which are representations of the transcendent spirit that unites us psychologically and socially. That's the nature of the biblical corpus and the human imagination or God's divine providence, take your choice, has picked these stories because they each shine a characterological light on the nature of the spirit that unites us in the highest possible sense. So we can walk through that relatively quickly. So in the story of Adam and Eve, God is not least. And this is a God as character or God as model for ritual emulation or God as, yeah, God as central narrative figure. That's another way of thinking about it. God is the spirit that you walk with when you're not self-conscious in a well-tended garden. Okay, so why do you have a garden? It's precisely so you can do that. To forget about yourself for a minute, to engage in the apprehension of something balanced and beautiful, a walled garden, the proper, the proper integration of culture and nature. And the proper apprehension in that situation frees you of your self-conscious burden. And so for a moment you enter that transcendent state that's associated with the Edenic paradise. So that's God in that story. Later in the story of Adam and Eve, God is the spirit that calls you to conscience when, like Adam and Eve, you've bitten off more than you can chew. In the story of Cain and Abel, God is the spirit of conscience that calls to you when you've made improper sacrifices 
and are facing the consequence of your unwillingness to go all in on your life. In the story of Noah, God is the spirit that calls to you if you're wise when trouble is coming and you determine to batten down the hatches. In the story of Abraham, God is the spirit that calls the overprotected and unwilling despite their resistance out into the adventure of their life. In the story of Moses, God is the spirit that calls to those who are oppressed and in slavery to free themselves from the grip of tyranny, whether it's their psychological tyranny or whether it's the tyranny of the state. And so all of those stories point to an underlying transcendent unity of character, let's say, which is the proper model for worship and celebration and ritual emulation that's united, that's the antithesis to the let's say, darker and more multiplicitous spirits that might rule the world. And part of the religious enterprise is the, is the elaboration and understanding and then the incorporation, ingestion, and modeling of that spirit in your own life. And to the degree that you do that, you do what the Logos did at the beginning of time in Genesis. You use truth truthful speech guided, let's say, by love to confront the transforming horizon of the future, the chaos and potential of the transforming potential, transforming horizon of the future, and turn it into the habitable order that is good. And that's a manifestation of the image of God that men and women are made in. And Responsibility. Responsibility in some sense, that's maturity, but I would also say that's the adventure of your life. And how is that tied to the idea of sacrifice? Well, what do you have to sacrifice if you're responsible? And the answer is you have to sacrifice your short-term hedonic and immature whims, right? So if you're a child, if you're two, you're impulsive, and that means that you only act for the moment, and you only act in relationship to what it is that you, as a singular individual, want in that moment. And that's just not a tenable solution to the complexities of life because you don't just exist in a moment. You exist as an iterated set of identities across time. You yourself are a community that extends across time. And you have to govern every action that you take in the present in relationship to the fact that you can do what you want tonight, man, but you got to put up with yourself tomorrow morning. And you got to put up with yourself for what you did tonight, next week, and next year, and five years from now. And every single one of your actions is like that. And so, in order to act properly, you have to sacrifice the impulsive gratification and the easy way out that's characteristic of the moment and extend yourself across time so that you are acting in concert with the highest interest of yourself in the broadest possible range of context. And that's what it means to be an adult. And you do exactly the same thing with other people. In a relationship, in a marriage, you're not just who you say you are from moment to moment. You have to negotiate very carefully with your wife or with your husband on an ongoing basis, every week, every moment in some sense while you're communicating to understand not only how you can get what you need and you want, which may be necessary and and, and, and important, especially in the long run, because you have to treat yourself properly, but so that you can do that in a way that your partner can also get what he or she needs and wants in a way that makes both of you more likely to get what you need and want over the long span and more so than you would get if you were alone. And if it wasn't the case, why would you bother with it? And then you have to incorporate children into that too, and that gets to be a more complex unity. So if there's five of you, well, how do you balance your individual needs and wants with, the with that small collective? And that's the negotiation process that goes on in a family, and hopefully you do that too in the spirit of reciprocity and truth and love. And you take on that responsibility, and that's the core aspect of sacrifice. Right, the, the great discovery of the human race. That's what sacrifice means. And you make... You sacrifice the foolishness of yourself. You sacrifice the momentary foolishness of yourself to the highest good that you can possibly imagine. And there's nothing in that that isn't good, even though it's difficult. And so, and that's not mere inhibition of those impulsive gratifications that if only were allowed to be manifest fully would set you free. Quite the contrary, you would have precisely the freedom of an extremely badly behaved two-year-old. And that's no freedom at all, right? All that is is freedom to wander in the street and get crushed by the first car that drives by. And there's nothing in that that's proper unless you're two. And then only for a year. So...
story, unity, responsibility. So, what do we have to offer as an alternative to the to a story so pathological that it's almost impossible to comprehend. That story is one pixel representation of the world. It's all about power. It's like, that's great. You've summed up the whole world in one phrase, have you? Been able to memorize that in your propaganda class in one minute. Now you have an explanation for every form of human interaction. You have a global explanation for the entire past and the present and the future. And not only that, by standing up against power, whatever that happens to be, you are now a saintly moral exemplar merely as a consequence of have swal having swallowed this one lie. It's like, plus, it's so convenient, as I said before, on the moral front, that if it's all about power, then that justifies my use of power. Because it's naive to think that there's anything else. Is there anything else? Yeah. There's plenty else. There's, there's all the eternal verities. There's truth and beauty and love and justice. And there's the great stories that we've been telling to one another for immense spans of time that have guided our culture and shaped our perceptions and still continue to shape our perceptions in the most fundamental way. We need to understand these stories in a manner we haven't been able to understand them before and to understand that they are describing the very means by which we perceive the world itself. And that the understanding deeply contemplated by successive hundreds of generations of human beings has winnowed out for us a pathway forward if we only have the imagination and the wherewithal and the moral courage to look and to listen and to understand and most importantly to act out, to take on that responsibility, right? To confront the cha transforming horizon of the chaotic future, the unpredictable chaotic future, all that infinite potential there. That's where the infinite and the finite meet, right? On the horizon of the future. And to chart our course forward, guided by the better story. And as Jews in Israel, are you telling the greatest story ever told? Well, you decide that by how you live. And that decision will affect the world because everyone looks here for one reason or another. It's not so easy to understand. Everyone looks here to see, well, how are you actually doing under this tremendous assault of adversarial criticism as this little tiny people in the middle of no man's land in some real sense as a, what would you say, cardinal model of the nation state and the city on the hill. You have a tremendous moral responsibility like you have perhaps for your entire history for reasons that are very difficult to understand. And I think it is true in some real sense that the fate of the world depends on the decisions of the people of Israel just as the fate of the world depends just as the fate of the world depends on the decision of every individual. So you make yourself a shining light on the hill, right? You attract people here because of what you're capable of doing. You show the world what the holy city... could look like. Because we need it. We need it. And it's up to you to do it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Wow. Thank you very much, Dr. Peterson. I think the applause explained how we try to understand. Now for the debate, the conversation, sorry, not debate, the conversation we will have now between Dr. Jordan Peterson. I would like to invite Ben Shapiro back to the stage. Beautiful. Many people, <laughs> many people speak about Jerusalem. Generations, dreamt about Jerusalem 
for thousands of years. The brave ones had the honor and the right to fight for Jerusalem. And in honor of all these dreamers and all these fighters, only a handful have succeeded to give Jerusalem its international status it deserves. Ambassador David Friedman <laughs> Ambassador David Friedman is one of those few who managed to return Jerusalem back into a city of peace. <laughs> Making the world acknowledge the importance of Jerusalem and making peace on Jerusalem's behalf. Ambassador David Friedman, thank you very much for being here with us. So I've been on your show, Ben, and I've been in your show, <laughs> Jordan, and now uh, uh, I find myself in unfamiliar territory, being the one asking the questions. I hope it, uh, I hope it goes well. Um, uh, it is such, it is such an incredible thrill to be here with both of you in uh, Jerusalem, the eternal, undivided, forever capital of the Jewish people. And, you know, um, people, uh, you know, I've given a couple of speeches in my time also, including from the stage, and people say, you know, you sound a little bit like Ben Shapiro and Jordan Peterson, and how would you, uh, how would you distinguish yourself from them? And my answer is if, if I had another 50 points of IQ, I would be, uh, I would be like both of you. Um, and let me just, uh, let me just thank... Uh, uh, the Tikva Fund and Amiyad Cohen and all his group. You know, so many people deserve so much credit. Understand that this place is packed and it, the tickets just went on sale about, about two weeks ago. I mean, if there were another 10,000 seats, you guys would have filled it. And by the way, nobody knew I was coming, so I can't take any, <laughs> any credit for it. So it's, it's all you too. But uh, call a vote to all of you for coming. You know, you've, got, you've all got to build a sukkah and prepare for the Chag. And so this is just incredible that you're all here. Okay. Um, uh, let's go through a couple of questions. I think these probably represent some questions people are interested in. Um, each one of them, you guys could probably take uh, a half an hour to answer. So let's try to get it. We'll try to get some tight answers and, and plow through some of these things. Okay. The first one on everybody's mind. Uh, we'll start with uh, Dr. Peterson. Um, whether it was the ancient Greeks or the Romans or the Ottoman Turks or the Brits, you know, empires tend to have an arc of about a few hundred years. And now here we are uh, with a 250-year-old American empire. It's a deeply divided country. Uh, we're struggling. Um, where do we go from here? Are we on the downslope? And what can we do to reverse the negative trends? We'll start with you. Well, whether we're on a downward slope or not depends on the decisions that people make. I would say, when I look at the world, I see a place of infinite catastrophic possibility looming very large, side by side with infinite superabundance on a scale that we could hardly possibly imagine. And I think that that... that uh, well, that's what you're exploring here in Israel to a large degree. I mean, you're, you, you, you're, you're, the society that you've produced here has so much potential, and it's really starting to realize itself intellectually. I would say, what would you say, over the last 10 years, something like that, especially on the tech front? I mean, God only knows what could be done here if everyone got their act together and you were left alone a bit to do what you could do. And maybe, 
able to negotiate peacefully with your neighbors, including those who most recently signed, let's say, the Abraham Accords, and for, hooray for that. There's a, a man named Marion Tupi, who you should know about. Tupi, T-U-P-Y, just wrote a book called Superabundance, and he's done some very interesting economic calculations in that book, showing, for example, that the wealth of the world is now, in terms of pure purchasing power, is doubling every 14 years, which is absolutely beyond comprehension. In China, every seven years. People are twice as rich every seven years in China. It's just beyond comprehension. And that every child born now instead of being a net drain on resources, according to Tupi's calculations, will produce seven times as many resources in their lifetime as they consume. And so, we could have a world where everyone had more than enough, more than enough to eat, more than enough space, more than enough freedom, more than enough education, and that's right in front of us. Or we could break everything like resentful fools, and man, it's a tight battle at the moment. And so, one of the things that people on the more <laughs> traditional front have to do is to tell a better story. And Ben and I have been working, I would say, diligently on that front, trying to, and very many other people as well. Jonathan Paggio is a key player in that, as is John Verveke, I would say. And there's other people, of course, um, trying to lay out what a better story would look like. And the best story, may the best story win. That's the issue. May the best story win. And so it's up to us to tell a good story and to act one out. And, and it's up to the Republicans in the U.S. to you know, dissociate themselves from this victimization narrative, which was, oh my God, I'm such a loser, the election was stolen from me, which is pretty off-brand for Mr. Trump, I must say. And con traditionalists and conservatives have a hard time articulating their story because their default is, well, we should do what we always did, and fair enough, you know, that's almost true because things do change and you have to change somewhat, And but it's time for... It's time for us to make our axioms explicit. And I think that's what I did to some degree in my books, which is why they became successful. And people say to me, well, you gave me words for things I knew to be true but didn't know how to say. It's like, in a time of crisis, you have to make the self-evident explicit. And that's part of what great storytelling is all about. So. Thank you. Thank you. Well. Bismarck once said that God protects idiots, drunkards, children in the United States of America. <laughs> and that seems about right. The, the fact is that the United States right now, as Jordan is saying, you know, it, it feels like everything's an inflection point because it is an inflection point. You have one vision of America that basically breaks all of the fundamental principles upon which it was built. And then you have a backlash that is brewing. That backlash is coming and it's very, very strong. Uh, and I'm more encouraged about the future of the country more encouraged than I have been maybe any time in my lifetime. Uh, and that's because I, I see this backlash brewing against an extraordinary radical leftist agenda that takes on issues as basic as what is a man and what is a woman and should marriage be between a man and a woman? What can a child expect from life? Is fairness about result or is fairness about opportunity? Uh, is, is equality of outcome the goal or is it really just equality of rights. Now, all of these are basic questions that are being asked, but I think that the left has pushed so far that the pushback is going to be extraordinarily strenuous. And that I'm, I'm very much encouraged by. You, you can see that the United States is still the best bet on planet Earth. You know, the, the fact is that decline is a choice, is something Charles Krauthammer once said, and he's correct. Decline is a choice. You can choose to decline because you've decided that you're more interested in paying everybody to stay home uh, and, and you're more interested in solipsistically navel-gazing about your individual sexual identity, or you can decide that you actually wish to build something useful with your life, and it includes aspects of individuality and identity, of course, because what would life be without those things? But it really is about building something that's truer and longer-lasting. And again, Edmund Burke suggested that we're part of a bargain between those who are already dead and those who have not yet been born, and I think that that bargain is being remade in real time by a lot of people who are, who are really fighting back in strong ways against an open attempt to, to dissolve the bonds that, that have created the United States in the first place. I'm, I'm really optimistic, actually, about the United States of America. Mm -hmm. So, let me start with you on this one, Ben. Um, this is a conference on, on liberty. And um, we, don't, we don't wrestle with that concept much in the United States, or Israel as a concept, as, as a goal. But uh, you know, liberty hasn't worked perfectly elsewhere in the world. You remember about 10 years ago, we had the Arab Spring, and it didn't bring us any more, uh, 
a, any, any advancements in human rights or in democracy. We had a, uh, an election in, uh, in Egypt that brought temporarily the Muslim Brotherhood to power. Uh, thank God that's, uh, that's not the case anymore. So as we talk about liberty here in the Middle East, not necessarily Israel, but in the Middle East, are there limits? Are there limits to how far we should be advancing liberty in an environment where we expect that the exercise of that liberty could really be very dangerous? Well, I mean, I think that we're defining liberty in a couple different senses, even in a question like that. So there's liberty to vote, and then there's actual fundamental human liberties, the, the right to freedom of religion or the right to free speech. In a country that has no history of, for example, the right to religion or the right to free speech or the right to own property, the liberty to vote doesn't do you a whole hell of a lot of good because the only thing that you're accustomed to having as a leadership class are people who are totalitarians. And that's what you saw when there was an election in Hamasistan over in the Gaza Strip. You know, it's very easy to say that everybody should be able to vote in their leadership. The minute they vote in a terrorist group, things get very clear very quickly. Uh, the, the, the fact is that the creation of democracy was actually the capstone in the development of liberty over the course of a millennia in places like Great Britain. And this idea that everything sort of just sprang full-fledged out of nowhere in about 1775 is just not true. I mean, there's a reason that, that liberty in the way that we understand it in the West arose in the West at a particular time, in a particular place, after hundreds of years of negotiation. I mean, Magna Carta is written 500 years before the Declaration of Independence. It takes quite a while to go from point A to point B. And expecting that every society is simply going to and graft on the institutions of the West that, again, have been developed evolutionarily over the course of centuries. They're just going to do that overnight, and then magically, freedom lives in every human heart. I think, you know, listen, I, I voted for George W. Bush when I was old enough to in 2004, uh, and I think that one of the most foolish things he ever said is the idea that liberty is the beating heart that, that, that sort of animates every human being. Well, you have to be taught to love liberty. If people loved liberty innately, at least at the expense of other values, then everything would be very easy, but things are not easy, and in fact, you have to have cultures that inculcate values that are worth inculcating over the course of time. And that, that, takes, some, that takes some work and that takes some time. And, and uh, that work and that time have not taken place in a lot of countries. Well, we could also point out the integral relationship between liberty and responsibility. Because in some sense, some real sense, someone else's rights are my responsibility and vice versa. That almost defines the relationship between rights between people. Um, and liberty is not... The, the allowance to engage in every short-term hedonistic whim impulse. That's chaos. That's not liberty. Liberty is more like what occurs when you have skillful players who are all playing the same game. And so, a game is a good model, right? Because the people who are playing a game, well, they want to play the game. So, you're in a free association if you're playing a game. If you're compelled to play, it's not a game. So you have to do it freely. You have to do it voluntarily. You have to abide by a set of governing principles that lay out the domain for peaceful cooperation and competition within the game. Imagine a game of opposing teams, let's say. And so the, the rules underneath are the preconditions for the freedom of the game. And so liberty, if liberty is the playing of a game, which I think is an optimized description of liberty, then it has to take place within a set of agreed upon rules that set the playing field for the game. And there, there, there aren't an unlimited number of playable games. We know this not least because of attempts to produce multiplayer worlds online. Some multiplayer worlds degenerate into chaos and catastrophe because they turn out not to be iterable playable games. And so the the universe of playable games is actually structured in some, some way that we don't fully explicitly understand, but it does abide by certain principles, like, well, for it to be a game, it has to be a game played by people who are voluntarily, voluntarily associating. And then there has to be a minimal number of principles that everyone understands, and there has to be some structure of hierarchical punishment and threat and reward. And you have to be a good loser, and you have to be a good winner, and you have to want to play the game again, and you have to facilitate the development of your teammates, all of that. And so liberty has to be construed not so much as the absence of super-ego-like rules that are doing nothing but imposing upon your hedonic, narcissistic, biological whims as more like the integral balancing of all your motivations and emotions within an iterable structure. That's a liberty. It's like a game. When God tells Moses to tell the Pharaoh to let the people go, that is not what he says. He does not say, tell Pharaoh to let my people go. He tells Pharaoh, let my people go so they may serve me in the wilderness. 
And that's repeated 10 times, which means that God means it, by the way, because <laughs> that's why he says it 10 times. And it means something like, when you move from t freedom and you move into chaos, all you've done is move from tyranny into the desert. And the desert's no better than the tyranny. That's why the Israelites get all fractious in the desert. That's why they wander around blindly for 40 years. It's like out of the tyranny where everything was ordered into the desert where nothing is ordered. It's like that's not an improvement. And whatever the promised land is, it's not the mere domain of narcissistic two-year-old impulsive whims and, 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 and freedoms in that sense. I can do anything. It's like, well, no, you can't. Yeah. No, you can't. And you don't even want to. Uh, ben, let, I, I'd like to talk to you about morality, but not in an individual sense, but more in a, in a national sense. And I lived with this when I was ambassador in, in Israel. You know, Israel's a little tiny country, right? And it obviously its most important ally is the United States. But it has other relationships too. It has relationships in Africa and in Europe and in, and in China. And we used to always try to, if, to the extent that we could, uh, and it was appropriate, we would try to steer Israel and its business dealings away from countries that we didn't trust. Um, but it, but it's, it's, it's complicated. And it's gotten even more complicated now with the Russian invasion of Ukraine because Russia has a large Jewish population and because Russia is on Israel's doorstep in, uh, in, in Syria. So uh, how should a government, how should a country, that obviously its first responsibility is to its own citizens, how does a, how does a government sort this out, the, the completing the competing, you know, moral uh, challenges uh, that it faces of uh, the type that I discussed. Well, when you're talking about a country like Israel, or many of the countries of Eastern Europe, for that matter, where, where their own survival is at stake, the first rule is, in order to have a country that is able to act in the future, it actually has to survive. Uh, and so, you know, if the United States is asking, whether it's Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, or Israel, to foot the bill for commitments the United States is making in a way that is unfootable, those countries simply will not do it, and for the United States to suspect anything else is, is foolish. Uh, you know, that, that's why if the United States is going to ask things of its allies, it needs to also provide an incentive structure for its allies that makes it beneficial for its allies to, to do those things. And they, that, that's why you know, when, when there's a lot of pressure on Israel, for example, to be shipping things like Iron Dome to Ukraine in the middle of uh, a, a debate over whether Russia was going to allow Israel to take action against terrorists in Syria, you know, that what exactly was being asked of Israel was unsustainable. And Right now, what's being asked of Eastern Europe may, may be unsustainable. The, the, the United States has a terrible habit of writing checks its body can't cash. Uh, and that's particularly true on foreign policy. Uh, the, we Americans are a very ideologically driven lot when it comes to foreign policy, which means that we vacillate wildly between head-in-the-sand isolationism and rah-rah interventionism. Uh, and when we get involved, we don't tend to have the will to actually carry things through for significant periods of time, which is why 38 million Afghans are now living under the predations of the Taliban, it's why Hong Kong is now living under the predations of China, it is why Taiwan is living under the nuclear umbrella of, of China as well, it's why the Kurds have been slaughtered multiple times. Again, th this is not to, to undermine what the United States has accomplished on planet Earth. The United States is the greatest force for liberty and freedom in the history of humanity, without a doubt. With that said, Historically, what has allowed America to be that force is not just an ideological commitment, but an understanding of what other countries' interests are. It took the Marshall Plan to ensure that Western Europe remained free of the communists. It took American commitment of arms and materiel in order to win World War I and II. It wasn't just a bunch of moral suasion. It wasn't just shipping weapons over there. Now, the fact is that if you're going to ask our allies to do things, you have to demonstrate to your allies that you are an ally worth having and that you are going to support them when times get tough. And I, I think that one of the big problems the United States has had is, again, this, this wild vacillation on foreign policy makes it very dangerous to be a pure ally of the United States, which is why you're seeing countries, forget Israel, like Saudi Arabia, hedging their bets over the course of the last 10 years. If you're the Saudis, can you count on the United States? Well, it depends who's president, right? If, if you're the Saudis and Iran is threatening you from Yemen and it's the Houthis, what exactly do you do? It, depend, it completely depends on whether Barack Obama, Donald Trump, or Joe Biden is president. So if you are trying to develop a long-term policy in a region with extraordinarily large levels of volatility, how do you develop a 10-year or 20-year policy under that, under that aegis? The only way to do that is to hedge your bets. America needs to understand that, and America needs to develop durable policies that understand that reality.
I think that was a good enough answer. You like that answer? Yeah. <laughs> I'll try to find you another question. Okay. Yeah, okay. Um, can we talk a couple minutes about nationalism? Mm -hmm. this, is, uh, this is a great example. Israel is a great example of nationalism working, right? This is the nation state of the Jewish people. It's just one of the greatest <laughs> achievements ever. The United States moves in and out of, uh, you know, a nationalistic view. Hungary moves in that direction. We see Italy moving in that direction. Sometimes it works great. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it works really badly. Mm -hmm. Is there a, sort of a shorthand way to, to, to think about good nationalism and bad nationalism? Mm -hmm. There's a very shorthand way. Render unto God what is God's and unto Caesar what is Caesar's. Right? And the problem, right, the problem with the nation state is that it can easily become God. Just like an ideology can and has, that's for sure. And so, everything in its proper place, right? That's the principle of subsidiarity. That's the principle of the alternative to tyranny that's developed in the story of Jethro and Moses in Exodus. So what happens in Exodus is that Moses is set up or sets himself up as the ultimate judge over the Israelites, right? They're in the desert. They've escaped from tyranny. They have a slave mentality. They're all fractious. They don't, they're squabbling amongst themselves because there's no hierarchy of authority. And uh, so Moses sets himself up as judge and he's judging them from early in the morning till late at night. And his father-in-law, who's a Midianite priest, uh, an archetype of the beneficial foreigner in some sense, was a very common theme in the, in the Old Testament, tells Moses he has to stop doing that because he's, he can't handle it first. It's going to wear him to a frazzle because no one can do that to be judge of everything and no one but God, let's say. But it's also really bad for the Israelites. And the reason for that is, well, if Moses makes all the decisions, then what are they? Just infants? Are they just children? Do they have no responsibility of their own? Real responsibility, right? Not artificial responsibility doled out on, from on high, but real responsibility. So. Um, Jethro tells Moses to divide the Israelites up into a hierarchy. Every ten nominates a, a, a leader, let's say a representative, and then the representatives unite and do the same thing all the way up to units of 10,000, and then Moses only does the, the uppermost judging, and that's the proper alternative to tyrannical structure. And you can, you can think of the nation as having a role in that subsidiary structure, right? Is that, well, there's the individual, and then there's the couple, and then there's the family, and then there's the local community, and then there's the state or province, and then there's the nation. And then maybe there's the international organization, but all that's subsumed over under some ultimately transcendent principle. And as long as the nation stays in its place and doesn't subsume the levels below it, which is what a fascist state does, um, well, a fascist state also subsumes the levels above it, as long as the nation doesn't become a pharaoh, then it can have its place. And I suppose the proper model for Israel, insofar as the Jews are a model nation state, is to find the nation that has its place, its proper place, not no place. Because people long for a national identity, because we need it. We need these hierarchical levels of identity. This is also what's so unbelievably pathological about the modern conversation about identity. It's like, identity is what I say I am, moment to moment. It's like. Where the hell does that leave you? I mean it. I mean, where does that leave you? You, you just are whatever you feel you are? First of all, that's again what a two-year-old thinks and does. And I mean that literally. But worse than that, it's so empty. It's like, no, you're, 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 your identity is, a, is, a, is part of a social contract you negotiate with others. Obviously, you have to play a game with your wife and that modifies your identity, doesn't it? It better because you're probably pretty clueless and maybe she can help with that, at least slightly, even though you're intransigent and impossible to train, you know. You might have some hope and perhaps vice versa. And then you have the same relationship with your kids. It's a mutually modifying relationship if you have any capacity for growth and the same at every level. And you need something like that at the national level too. And then underneath or above that, let's say, whatever loose international organizations we can devise for the purpose of national peace, and then above that, whatever the transcendent unity that rules above all of us happens to be. So, everything in its proper place, right? And, yeah. and nothing takes all except God, let's say, 
And even God could use a hierarchy underneath him to get the message out. Yeah. So I think you're a fulfilling part of that hierarchy right now. <laughs> So I, I want to I give each of you a chance to sort of make a, uh, a closing statement, but I'm going to give you a little guidance, uh, maybe move you in a particular direction. So I think you both know how much I love uh, Jerusalem. And, um, uh, you know, I've said this many times, it's because of, it's not in spite of, but it's because of our moving the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem that we achieved the Abraham Accords. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> You know, the, the prophet Isaiah, I know you're both biblical scholars, the prophet Isaiah speaks of Jerusalem as really, well, you know, literally it means city of peace, and it's, the, it's where the nations of the world will hopefully all come. For those who speak Hebrew, ki beti beit filah, yikere l'chol ha'amim, not just the Jews, but all the people of the world will come to the Jerusalem as the path to peace. And ha, ha, having said that, uh, a few words about what it means to both of you to be here and to address this uh, adoring crowd. I mean, you really guys have gotten <laughs> quite, quite the reception. And um, <laughs> and maybe if you could also offer a word of advice to, the, to these great people who really, as you can see, are, are, are hungry and thirsty to really participate in the advancement of Western civilization, of conservative principles from this little tiny, you know, postage stamp of a country here in, in the Middle East. Uh, all that they've accomplished, there's somewhere they want to do and help. Maybe you can give them some advice as well. Let me start with Ben. So, when it comes to Jerusalem, obviously, as a Jew, you know, being in Jerusalem has special meaning to me. Every time I come to Jerusalem, I make a point to go up on Har Habayit, go up on the Temple Mount, which is... which contrary to the utter morons of the New York Times, is actually the holiest site in Judaism, not the Kotel, not the Western Wall. Yeah, as I talked about a little bit, Jerusalem lies at the center of all Western civilization. The description of Jerusalem as axis mundi is the, the axis upon which the world turns, the center, center stone of Western civilization is true. The, the revelation at Sinai combined with the ideas of Greek reason created the West. Uh, and that understanding has led to everything ranging from the democracies that we love to the iPhones in our pockets. None of that exists absent the city of Jerusalem and, and what it means. Uh, as far as advice to you know, all of you, first of all, I, I think that many people in Israel should give advice to other people in, uh, in collapsing parts of the West. Uh, as, I, as I spoke about in Tel Aviv a few months ago, you guys, first of all, know how to have kids, which is a good thing. Uh, this is being... <laughs> This is literally the only Western country that has above replacement rate reproduction, Jeez. which is an amazing statement about the collapse of the West, but also about what it means to have social capital in a country like Israel and why social capital matters. It's why when you're talking about nationalism, the simple fact is that nationalism is just one aspect of social capital that begins at the family level and then moves on up through community to the nation state level. Without that social capital, everything collapses, which means that the utter potential that Jordan was talking about, the opportunity to unlock potential in this country is absolutely astonishing. So every American who comes to Israel has their Israel story. So here is my, here is my Israel story about the two nisim, the two miracles that Israel represents. One, that it exists, and two, that it functions at all. Because... <laughs> yeah. So I was... Um, I was recently looking for real estate with one of my friends in, uh, in, in a place that will remain unnamed uh, in Israel for reasons that will become apparent momentarily. And, um, and one of the things that we were looking at was an empty lot, and next to that empty lot was a house. And uh, I was going to buy the house, he was going to buy the empty lot, and then he was going to live in that house while he, while he built up on the empty lot next door. And uh, so the person who owned this house said to me, here's the price. And I said, perfect, sounds good. And he said, ah, now we begin to negotiate. <laughs> <laughs> and I, being American, said, what the hell are you talking about? You just gave me a price, and I said, yes, we're done now. Like, that's the end of the process. He said, no, you don't understand. What I really want is I want four-fifths of the price in shekel, and I want one-fifth of the price in American cash in a bag. And 
And I said to him, well, that's insane. I'm not committing tax fraud for you. What if, what if I actually just pay over the top so you get the same amount of money and I pay the taxes, right? And everybody goes home happy. The real estate agent who's brokering this deal says to me, and this is, again, such an Israel story. He says to me, you can't do that. The price that he said is the price that, that you have to pay. And I said, that makes no sense. You're the real estate agent. You take a percentage of the total price, right? The higher the price, the higher your percentage. <laughs> and the real estate agent says, no, you don't, under you don't understand. He says, I live in this community. If you pay the price that you're talking about, he gets audited, and then everybody in the community gets audited because every single person in this community has been doing this. Mm. Now, <laughs> there are two ways to read this. One is that I just happened to stumble into Sodom and Gomorrah. The other way to, re uh, the other way to read this is that the taxes in this country are too damn high and the regulations are insane. <laughs> And the simple fact of the matter is that if the politicians would get over themselves for half a second, and I've talked to virtually all of them, and I have to say, it is, it is astonishing to talk with so many people who agree on all the fundamental issues and hate each other so much. It's like kiddish at any shul. This country is just kiddish at any shul. It's like they all agree with each other, they live in the same neighborhood, but there's only one piece of kugel, and everybody's going for the piece of kugel, and that's all that matters. <laughs> okay, the, if they would all get together and do the things they just agree on, like lowering the regulations and lowering the taxes and unshackling industry in this country and allowing you to buy property and to build. <laughs> then forget about this country actually being just in economic terms, a regional power, this country would be a world power. It really is that simple. The amount of intellectual capital in this country is insane and it needs to be unshackled and it needs to be freed. So that's my hope for you. So after this, go out and vote how you're gonna vote. I'm not gonna give any advice. And Find groups and politicians who are worthy of your support to actually remove the chains that are preventing this country from being what it ought to be economically, which means able to defend itself, which means able to be a beacon to the nations. I should have warned you that uh, the easiest applause line was just to advocate for lower taxes. <laughs> so, uh, you know, he, he had an advantage over here there. But, <laughs> but. So, if Jerusalem is a city of peace, and if the principle of subsidiarity, this distributed hierarchical responsibility holds, then I would say, what's my hope? My hope is that you make peace in your own houses. And that's very difficult. Because, so I, I don't like conflict at all, and the reason I engage in it is because I don't like to see it propagate. And so I learned a lot of things when I was a clinician in the tens of thousands of hours that I helped people untangle horrifically difficult problems. And one thing I learned was, yeah, there's nothing that happens that won't be revealed and you never get away with anything. I never saw anyone in my clinical practice ever get away with anything even once. And what I saw people often do in my clinical practice and in my private life was impose a false peace. And what that means in, in a household, and you can tell when you're in a house like that, is everyone walks on eggshells, or actually they're walking on snake eggshells, to, to say it more truly, is that there are horrible things everywhere, in every nook and cranny, underneath every carpet, in every cupboard, and everyone is afraid to point to the, let's say, 800-pound gorilla, 800 gorilla in the room to mix metaphors terribly, or the elephant under the carpet, or the skeletons in the closet. <laughs> you, to make peace, you have to confront the serpent in the garden, let's say, really. And peace comes when everyone is in accord. And a false peace is just a tyranny. And to sort everything out with your wife and to sort everything out with your children, that's unbelievably difficult. And then to sort everything out with all of the nooks and terrible crannies of your soul to bring peace to your house. And if you learn to do that, which you can, and you can do that by, with courage, to confront the things you know to be true, to say what you have to say carefully, right, and with love and with an eye to what's best, if you can manage it, if you can bring peace to your house, then you can learn to bring peace to your community, and if you can bring peace to the community, then 
you can make some headway in bringing peace to the world. But these things start locally as far as I'm concerned. And you, in some sense, that's so heartening because it means you have all the possibility of the world at hand. And you might say, well, I have a lot of problems. It's like, well, yes, you have all the problems there are. They're right at hand. And, and I know that people find themselves in dire straits on the personal front, but that's a reflection of the underlying structure of the world. And you have those problems in your house. You could solve them. And then if you learn to solve them, then you'll be the person who can solve those problems. And that's, a, that's a, an asset you can take out everywhere. And so you take the problems of your own life seriously and you try to create peace. And if you all do that within the confines of your own life, then you can all do it as a community. And then you can be the shining light on the hill that Jerusalem is supposed to be. You take your personal responsibility seriously as if the weight of the world rests on your shoulders in all the decisions that you make because because you're made in the image of God the weight of the world does rest on your shoulders at every moment that's actually true and if you do not live up to that responsibility then everything degenerates and it's on you look you people you have to know this what do you think happened in Nazi Germany what do you think happened you think individuals lived up to their responsibility or did they lie about everything? Did they abdicate all their responsibility? Did they not speak up when they, when, they, when they should have spoke up? Did they let the snakes under the carpet turn into terrible, paralyzing, genocidal monsters? And didn't they do that in the confines of their own house? And when you're called upon to hold your tongue for ideological reasons now, don't you think you're doing the same thing? And where do you think it'll end? How many times has it ended like that? Uh, what's Solzhenitsyn say? One man who stops lying can bring down a tyranny. And we know what tyranny ends in. So don't lie. Not in your own household. Not to yourself. Not in public. Make peace. And then we'll have a society built on truth and peace. And wouldn't we want that if we could have it? And so you start by doing that. Like now, to the degree that you can. And that's where the reality is. Really, for everyone, the ultimate reality is right there, right at hand, right in front of you, made, as the, made in the image of God as you are. So... Wow, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> and now, I think after this crazy conversation and two speeches, to the little bit part that the audience like is the Q&A with the audience. So here on my left, there's a queue already. Yes, po kvar shura istadra. People are waiting in line and for, like. They're waiting for this. Um, yes, it's, it's a real surprise that Israelis waiting in line. So please sit down. We have time for only five <laughs> questions. So the line is like 50 people long already. So let's start with the first question. Thank you very much. Hi. Hi. Welcome to Israel. <laughs> I speak for everyone here when I say this is an honor. We are truly privileged to be here tonight. Thank you. With your guidance, each of us is striving for excellence and is filled with gratitude to God for the beautiful world we live in. Thank you. Please, a question. Ben, last time you were here, I tried to give you a t-shirt <laughs> that says, facts don't care about your feelings, but in Hebrew, it rhymes, wait for it, uvdot adishot lirgashot. Boom. <laughs> Did you get it? I tried, to, I tried to pass it to you anyway. By the way, you're all welcome to our pod podcast, Yosevich, just so you know. <laughs> Here is my question. My question is, 
Would you agree that one of the most fundamental sentiments to cultivate in people's spirits is the sense of gratitude? Thank you. I mean, to me, it is the most fundamental thing that our society is lacking. I think kids are lacking it. I think parents are lacking it. I think all of us are lacking it. I, I think that the basic idea that is often promulgated that there was a better time to live in human history uh, is fundamentally mistaken. There was no paradisical state 200 years ago or 400 years ago or 600 years ago. We are all the beneficiaries of people who came before us. Uh, and, and what that means, if we had any level of gratitude, is that we would not take for granted a tradition that's been handed to us. One of the great dangers that I see in society, and I'll make this brief, is, is the, the danger uh, that I mentioned briefly, which is sort of pure rationalism, this idea that whatever idea comes out of our head at any given moment without any reference to the past whatsoever, we should just discard and jettison tradition and we should put in place whatever that utopian ideal is. And there is no higher form of foolishness than this. The tradition that we've been granted and all the blessings that we've been granted it is our job to, to first understand those traditions before we think about changing those traditions. Chesterton famously suggested that the difference between a conservative and a leftist was that uh, a leftist would, would come along in a field and, and see a fence and then not know why the fence was there and immediately say, let's uproot the fence. And a conservative would come along and not know why the fence is there and say, I'm not uprooting this fence until I find out why this fence was there in the first place. And gratitude requires us to understand why the fence was there in the first place before we just start pulling up the stones. I think, I, I think it's, it's very much worthwhile to consider why gratitude is a virtue. And one of the things I think that conservatives do badly in relationship to virtues, in some sense, is to try to impose them. Say, you should do this, as if it's the right thing to do. Now, it is the right thing to do, but it's the right thing to do not so much because you should do it, even though you should, because it's but because it's better if you do it. It's better for you and for everyone else. And so let's think about gratitude. Well, I don't think the question is what should you be grateful for? I think the question is how can you practice being wise enough so that your fundamental attitude to the world is one of gratitude? And that's really hard, you know? So one of the things that my family has learned because we've been the targets of many serpentine attacks is that we could turn an attack into an opportunity if we were careful, if we looked for the opportunity, if we, if we could see the adversarial force even as, it's very stretching things to say this, but as something to be grateful for. It is definitely the case that the journalists who've attacked me the most viciously have been the most profound contributors to my success. <laughs> well, isn't that strange though, right? Because that isn't what you'd think. And so what we learned was that when we were attacked, if we could hold our ground and try to, I don't mean seek naively for the silver lining in the sort of sense that this is the best of all possible worlds in that Panglossian sense, but to turn even adversarial challenge into a field of opportunity that that's a practice, right? It's something you can get better and better at. And in any situation, no matter how difficult, perhaps it's your ability to seek out what you could be humbly grateful for that will guide you through it. So imagine, I've seen this when people were encountering death. So when, when, my, when my wife's mother died, she died of a terrible degenerative neurological condition akin to Alzheimer's. And it was pretty damn brutal because neurological diseases are pretty brutal. And so she just, she, we just lost pieces of her, you know, day by day for 15 years, and it was quite the catastrophe for the family, but it was, it was something to watch, too, because her husband, Del Roberts, my father-in-law, who was quite the man about town in our little town, he was like the most extroverted person in the whole town, and uh, he was quite the, he is quite the party animal, and a great guy, great sense of humor. Um, he cared for his wife, so diligently that it was really a miracle to watch. And his children were grateful to him for that, and it increased their love for him. And as she died, and then when she died, the family looked at each other and realized what they had in each other, and they pulled together in quite a remarkable way, dispensing with many of the unpleasant and unnecessary, fractious, 
disagreements that had destroyed their unity or had, had impaired their unity. They had a pretty good family, but no family is perfect. They came together in this time of death, and it was partly because they looked around to see what they had that they could be grateful for. And what was so interesting about that was that it was a balm, B-A-L-M, like a, for, for the death itself. It, it isn't like my mother-in-law's death was nothing. It, it wasn't like that didn't tear a, fabric, a hole in the fabric of the family's being, but because they were able to orient themselves to what was good that they had with themselves, which in some sense was an infinite resource that they could draw on, un, as of yet unrevealed revealed possibilities of love to provide them with, with succor through their grief. And then that became permanent. And so you just don't know, you know, how skillful could you get if one of the things you practiced was gratitude? And then you can also think of it not as a form of naivety, because naive people can be grateful because they don't know better, but as a form of courage, right? Because the world is a terrible and formidable place, and you have real adversaries and sometimes deadly adversaries in nature and in culture. And if you can cultivate that sense of rigorous gratitude, then God only knows what you can extract even from the worst of situations. And don't you need to know how you could best extract what was best from the worst of situations? And, be, and gratitude is one of the virtues that allows you to do exactly that. And so it's worth practicing, right? It's a practice. It's a courageous practice. It's not just something you should do, right? It's a, something that illuminates everything to, to see the mystery and beauty in things, even, even in moments of tragedy. That's a real art, you know? It's the art of great artists to do that. It really is. So... Professor Peterson, thank you very much for carving your time to be here with us tonight. It's a great privilege. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, uh, Ambassador Friedman. I just want to piggyback on the last comment that the, uh, Professor Peterson makes, and I want to appeal to one of the subjects that is actually one of your favorite authors, which is uh, Dostoevsky. Um, Prince Mishkan is perhaps this ultimate um, ideal of humble selflessness and giving that you have been referring to. He attempts to help everyone. He puts his, uh, the needs of others above his own. Um, his compassion towards others knows no boundaries. And when we look at this idea of the ultimate good that, that Professor Peterson has been referring to, as a result, Prince Mishkan ends up unwittingly adding to the, to the destruction of the situation, as well as in the, ends up being destroyed himself and is called by all others in his surrounding as the idiot. I wonder if Professor Peterson could make a few comments about where has he gone wrong in the story. Well, it isn't necessarily obvious that he went wrong. I mean, one of the things that's so interesting about Dostoevsky, and I think this is one of the, what, this is part of what gave Dostoevsky an edge over Nietzsche in some sense, is Nietzsche had to make formal arguments. and. Whereas Dostoevsky could use characterization to, to, to demonstrate moral virtue. And so in, in the Brothers Karamazov, for example, it's pretty obvious that Ivan, who is the atheistic and charismatic brother Kar Karamazov, is the intellectual superior to Alyosha, and also the rhetoric, he's superior rhetorically. He makes the, one of the best cases for atheism on moral grounds that has ever been made in literature. But Alyosha is by far the more morally superior character. And you, you, you experience that moral superiority implicitly by watching how he manifests himself in the book. It's not an intellectual argument, it's, a, it's an argument of narrative. And so Dostoevsky can show how the properly oriented soul can defeat even the sharpest rational intellect. And Dostoevsky explores that again in The Idiot, because Mishkin is a a savior figure, and although in some sense you might say he loses all the battles, he wins the war. And that's a useful thing to know about your life, is that but this is, for example, I think why it requires faith to tell the truth, and why faith is a necessity. Faith is a necessity because you don't know what you're doing, and, and you can't in any final sense, so you have to always leap into the darkness. 
You, you have no choice. Well, you do. You can, you can not leap into the darkness, but then the darkness just engulfs you. So that's a choice, but it's not a good one. Because you're ignorant in some fundamental sense and because the future differs from the past, you have to leap into the unknown with principle. And one principle can be that the truth will set you free. And then the question is, well, how is that manifest? You say, well, I get in trouble when I call, tell the truth. It's like, yeah, fair enough. You also get in trouble when you don't tell the truth. You get to choose between the kinds of trouble, but you don't get to dispense with trouble itself. And the thing, what you have to decide, you have to decide this, is that if you build a world based on truth around you, is that the best of all possible worlds? And you can't use any given outcome to, to inform that, because many times when you say what you have to say, the first response is going to be trouble. And you'll think, well, I should have just lied. And why do you lie? Well, you lie so you don't get in trouble, obviously. Or you, you lie because you want to gain something that's not yours by right. And so you take this short-term approach to extracting order from chaos, and you think that's a victory, but, but it's not. It's a loss. But the loss is, in some sense, only demonstrable by faith, right? Is the world that you extract using truth the best possible world? You have to stake your life on that to find out. There's no other way of finding out. So, and that's what Mishkin does in The Idiot. And so, everyone thinks he's an idiot, but... What did Carl Jung say? The fool is the precursor to the savior. And, and that's, that's true in many, many ways. It's many, many ways. And so, you know, naive people blurt out the truth because they don't know any better, but wise people tell the truth because they know it's the best way forward. And both of them might look like fools, but that doesn't mean that they are. So... I want to thank the three of you for coming to Israel. I hope this is uh, the first visit of many visits in our country. <laughs> I'm a father of three young boys. Um, I find myself thinking a lot about the fact that my wife and I are raising a family in an amazing yet very complicated world where meaning can change daily, dependent on, dependent on what is the algorithm of the day. Do you have a suggestion for us, mothers and fathers, educators, about how should we conduct ourselves to raise independent thinkers and mentally strong children? Um, I'm sure Dr. Peterson will have a better answer, so um, I'll go first. So, uh, I'm also uh, a father of three, and first of all, let me say that all parents don't know anything because you don't know what's in the cake until it's baked. Um, but, with that, with that said, I, and, and I also note that you say you have three young boys, but according to the current standards of the West, we have no idea, frankly, until, you know, <laughs> 120 years are up, and at that point, who knows? Could be anything. Could be a salamander, you just don't know. So. Uh, to, to me, I mean, the way that I'm interested in, in raising my kids is, is them recognizing that there are certain fundamental non-negotiable truths, that there are certain things that you're going to have to assume about the world that make the world both livable and rational. And this is something that I think that a, a lot of folks on the other side of the aisle refuse to recognize, that there are any leaps of faith in their morality whatsoever, when in fact pretty much everything they say is a leap of faith away from both reason and science. You know, the, the, the understanding that the world is a place of intelligibility and that facts do exist and that truths do exist, that also is something that you have to embed yourself in a community to find. And one of the things that, that I think is dangerous for a lot of conservatives is conservatives tend to be very individualistic in orientation. We're very entrepreneurial, we tend to be people who want to forge out on our own. That's all, that's all wonderful qualities and that's stuff that we have to pass on to our kids. But the sense of embeddedness that children require in order to truly feel as though they are surrounded by a stable world, because that's what kids are really looking for. What they're looking for is a stable world in which to explore. And when that world is rocked by instability, 
that is when they, they fall off the path. That is when they fall into, into an enormous amount of confusion. Uh, that is when they begin to fall apart. And so it's our job as parents to make sure that the world in which they live is a stable one, first of all, at home between, you know, for me, for me and my wife, uh, and then beyond that, for our community, embed yourself in a great community. If you're not in a great community, find one right now. If you are talking about where your kids go to school, if you don't like the way that they're raising your kids at the school, if their values are different from yours, but they are also academically excellent, remove your kids from the school. And I'm seeing a lot of parents who are not doing this, and it's a huge mistake. And also recognize that as kids get older, it's important to inform them of the dangers outside. Because if they live in a non-oppositional world, they're not going to understand what those dangers are until it's just too late. And I see this with a lot of people of my generation and younger, is that they were so bubbled in that they never understood that there are threats from the outside to the way that they think, to their worldview, and to fundamental truths. Gradually exposing kids, not the youngest age, obviously, when they can't handle it, but as, as they get older, to the lies that exist and inoculating them against those lies with actual reasonable arguments is deeply necessary. And, you know, I, I think that I'm gratified that so many people who are young listen to Jordan or listen to my show. I think that that's young people who are looking for exactly that sense of, of sustainable, sustainable truth, eternal reality. And I think every parent is capable of granting that to their kids. In fact, that's our job. That's literally our job. That is what we are put on earth to do. All the other jobs are secondary. The only job that you have to, when, when all is said and done, what goes on your tombstone is good husband, good father. That's it. All the rest of that crap doesn't end up on the tombstone. So I would say I like one of the rules in my first book in relationship to this question, which is don't let your children do anything that makes you dislike them. <clears throat> and that means the you there is you and your wife together. I'm in serious trouble. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you and your wife together, like each of you on your own are half insane, but together you're more or less one sane thing. <laughs> and if that sane thing disapproves of the behavior of a child that you love, then other people will likely disapprove of that. And so it's incumbent on you to help your children learn to manifest the minimal number of socially undesirable behaviors possible. Because it's unbelievably important for them to make friends. And to make friends, they have to be fun to play with. And to be fun to play with, they have to be able to negotiate with others and to take their turn and to lose honorably and to win fairly and to be good sports. And you can tell when they're not being good sports because you might love them, but at that moment you don't like them and it's time to say or do something about that so they don't keep doing it. And that's appropriate discipline and it's a great favor to children and it's also a huge relief because they want to find out where the walls are so they can feel secure within them. And they'll push the limits to find the walls. But it's up to you to, to make the walls not too tight, but to make them firm where they exist. And then the second thing I would say is, and this is really something that will transform your relationships if you do it. You, you want to watch what unfolds in front of you. You want to watch it in you and in your wife and in your children. And you want to see when something happens, that you'd like to see happen more often when someone does something right. And this, is, this requires real attention. It's, it's easy to detect when someone does something wrong because it triggers you in some sense. It elicits negative emotion automatically. But when someone does something right, it's easy to just accept that as part of the normal course of things. And it's a, it's a mistake. If you see someone doing something right that you would like to see happen again, you can say to them, ha, I saw that. You just dared to do something right. And I really appreciate that. Here's what you did. I saw it. Here's the steps you took to make this good thing happen. You can pat your little kid on the head and say, you could do that again. That would be just fine. And they're so thrilled about that that they managed to let their light shine for a minute and someone saw it. They're so thrilled about that. And if you do that continually, they'll just keep doing that. They're so responsive to that parental attention that's associated with reward, it also minimizes the necessary use of, say, anxiety-provoking threat or, or walled-in punishment. And you can do that 
with your wife. This is a non-manipulative thing to do, right? Yet you have to have a clear head to do it. But you can also do it to yourself. When you see yourself do something that maybe was difficult and you did fine, you should note that and, you know, give yourself a little break. But if you do that with your kids, man, they will like you so much. They'll like you so much and vice versa. Thank you very much. And now for the last question. Wow, last question. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Dr. Peterson, my name is Sophia, and I'm from Montreal. Um, McGill alumna is like you. I've been a huge admirer of yours uh, ever since you took a stand against Bill six, uh, C6, C16. C16. Thank you. Um, back in 2016, and I'm so proud of your support of the trucker protest last winter. Uh, thank you. Um, you, both, you both talked about Israel's technological achievements and Jerusalem as the shining city on the hill, a light unto the nations, so to speak. With that in mind, what is your opinion of the way in which Israel pushed and promoted the COVID-19 Green Pass around the world? Something that, Israel, that Canada, United States, and Europe both all adopted but Israel was the first. And I'm proudly unvaccinated and never succumbed to the tyranny of the state. And unfortunately, unfortunately, we have stopped talking about the horrors of those two years, and I'm afraid that since we didn't fight back, they're gonna do this to us again in the future. Also, I would be very honored if you could sign my version <laughs> of your book, because I've read it back to cover to cover at least twice. <laughs> Thank you. Do you want to do you want to address that? Sure. First? So, I mean, uh, as uh, an outsider who was barred from traveling to Israel for several years uh, because of the the COVID policies of the state, the COVID policies were utterly insane, especially as the evidence emerged about what the vaccines did and what they didn't. I've always been of the opinion that at the very beginning of the pandemic, when very little was known about the disease, you have to give leeway to people to react in a variety of different ways, and then you see what works. The problem is that in Israel, as in where I used to live, California, the, the response was, even once we have the evidence, we will continue to cram down completely ascientific and nonsensical policy for the foreseeable future until such time as it becomes utterly impractical for us to do it any longer. And that was way too long in the state of Israel, as it was in California, as it was in New York, as it was in a wide variety of countries. So, yes, I mean, citizens must not allow their governments to lie to them like this again. The perversion of science on behalf of false COVID medicine is insanity. It's one of the last bastions of trust in the West was in scientific institutions that has been thoroughly destroyed uh, by COVID-19, among other myriad sins. Uh, and uh, if the scientific institutions wish to re regain the trust of the public in, in all of these countries, they're going to have to start, start by first presenting evidence and, uh, and second by showing a little bit of epistemological humility about what they know and what they don't and how much control they ought to exert over the common everyday human being. Thank you very much. I apologize, but we'll need to conclude this event. <laughs> But I will try. <laughs> <laughs> That's how you know it's Israel right there. Yeah. <laughs> you can conclude event, oh boy. And I will try to end this with a very nice note. This is a present. This is a page from a 16. <laughs> I guess they want me to answer the question. question? Sure. Okay. You noisy people. <laughs> See there, look, you, you, you voiced your opinion in a crowd. Good work. <laughs> so we have another question okay, there. So, so here's, okay. Follow the science, said no scientist ever. <laughs> <laughs> right, science, science is not okay. science is not the endeavor that lays out an ethical pathway. That's not what it is. And so it's the same is-ought problem. 
Just because there's a set of facts on the ground doesn't mean that that outlines an unerring path forward. And what the politicians did was they artificially, because they were cowardly and because they relied on opinion polls, and I know this for a fact, and so this is what happened in Canada, they used opinion polls and then post hoc justified their compliance with the opinion polls by forcing what was a false scientific consensus on people. And they did that consciously, knowing full well they were doing it. And they did that whether they were socialist or centrist or conservative. And it was utterly appalling. So no more this follow the science nonsense. Science is an enterprise that attempts to falsify itself constantly. Right? Science always assumes that what it's putting forward in some sense is insufficient and incorrect. And then also, there's the problem of the plethora of facts. And so one of the things that concerned me during the COVID lockdowns is, well, first, there was no all-cause mortality data on the COVID vaccines. And that's actually not a flaw. That's a fatal flaw. You mean you don't know if the vaccines killed more people than they saved. You actually don't know that. Well, no, we don't know that because we didn't have time to do the studies. Okay, that means you don't know it. And things go wrong badly. Now, I don't know if you know this, but you might, but there's been a substantial spike in all-cause mortality in Europe in the last five months. Like in Spain, it's 36% above normal. Why? Well, there's two possible reasons, and I don't know which of these is true, and there might be other reasons. One is the vaccines are killing people. Now, I doubt that, but it's possible. Okay, now, the more likely cause, I believe, is that because we prioritized COVID lockdown above all else, we stopped people from receiving necessary medical care on all sorts of fronts, and we stressed them three quarters to death. And so now, a bunch of them are dying. And my suspicions are, if we did the all-cause mortality analysis with any degree of, of uh, propriety, we'd find that the whole lockdown process I suspect it'll kill 100 people for everyone it saved. That's my guess. Now, that's a guess. And that would include the long-term consequences of supply chain disruptions, which are likely to cause people to starve. And also the potential exacerbation of the conflict with Russia, because one of the things I've wondered about is, well, did we not go and talk to Putin for like two years? Face to face? No, you, you were talking earlier, Ambassador, about the preconditions that are necessary to make peace with fractious countries. It's like, how about go and talk to somebody? Like, face to face, right? Not in an email, not by text, and not abstracted on Zoom, but so you can go out for dinner and have a drink and see that you're both human beings despite your differences. We have no idea how important that is. And so, no all-cause mortality data. That's a big problem. And then the fact that the left climbed in bed with the pharmaceutical companies, that was utterly shocking to me. I thought, if you would have polled leftists 10 years ago and you said, okay, who are your enemies? Well, capitalists, clearly. Okay, which capitalists? Oil companies. All right, number one, oil companies. Number two, pharmaceutical companies, for sure. But now they're your best friend. All of a sudden, well, why is that? Well, could it be because they offer the possibility of centralized power and control? Because it was the only thing I could see. It's like, why are pharmaceutical companies all of a sudden your friend? Okay, and so I'll close, I'll close with this. I'll close with this. Policy based on compulsion is self-destructive policy. Period. Now, you, you might have to... You have to make an exception, perhaps, for criminals. But that's also perhaps because we're not sophisticated enough to know, to know what to do with outright criminals that doesn't require compulsion. But as a good rule of thumb, if your damn policy, if your problem, if your solution to the problem means other people have to do what you're telling them to or else, then maybe you're a tyrant and not a proper leader. Yeah. Let's get another question, please. Thank you. Um, I was told to keep this short, and I can't speak nearly as quickly as you, Mr. Shapiro, but I'm going to try my best. Um, it's a political question for Mr. Friedman and a clinical question for Dr. Peterson. Um, 
I was driving through the Shomron recently on the way to visit my son at his military base, and um, there were signs all over telling us where we could and could not go, that there were areas that are forbidden for uh, Israeli citizens. I was wondering if you ca could comment on how that's congruent with being a sovereign state. Um, and then the clinical question I wanted to ask um, Dr. Peterson is, there seems to be a, a trend in some orthodox communities to encourage young adults suffering from mental illness to cut all ties with their families, um, families that are plagued with uh, imperfect parenting as opposed to some real um, abuse. And I'm wondering what you feel the role of the family could be in habilitating a, a young adult or a teen and um, whether we should encourage the, um, the family to play a role in, in, uh, in the life of uh, someone suffering from mental illness. I didn't hear it. No. Could you give me a summary of the question? <laughs> yeah. I, I couldn't hear you. I couldn't hear no, it, was, it wasn't because the question was poorly formulated. I just the I just, the acoustics aren't good. Okay, so, so the first so. question was, how are, how are the areas that are forbidden to Israeli citizens congruent with the fact that we claim to be a sovereign nation? Oh, that's a... <laughs> that, you, you, you may be asking the wrong person, but... Um, <laughs> um, you know, my, my boundaries are, uh, are determined by God, not by anybody else. So to me, the, the biblical boundaries of Israel are the boundaries of Israel. And I'm not, I'm not particularly uh, sanguine about the idea that Jewish people can't live anywhere and visit anywhere. So just by way of example, the idea that, that Joseph's tomb, Kever Yosef, which is one of the most important historical sites of the Jewish people, it's where... It's where, you know, Joseph, it's, it's, you know, Shlem is where Abraham started, and then full circle after going down to Egypt and coming back, at Joseph's request, his bones were reinterred in Shlem. It's really one of the most important places in Jewish history, and the fact that you risk your life going there, to me, is totally unacceptable. The second question of the family. Your second question on the family. Okay. Um, the role that the family can play in um, habilitating um, young adults with mental illness as opposed to the trend um, to con convincing them or encouraging them to sever all ties with their parents and with family members um, where there isn't any abuse uh, going on, maybe, you know, a little bit of imperfect parenting. Can you comment on that, please? Can you weigh in? I think it's an important question, an issue for our community. Well, the problem with answering clinical questions, I would say generally or, or generically, is that the devil's always in the details, which is why clinical practice is an individual issue. I mean, I've had clients who I listen to for long periods of time where we, and the consequence of that was the formulation, for example, in one case, I had a female client whose mother phoned her three times a day. And you might think, well, her mother loved her a lot. It's like, yeah, she was 30. She loved her a little too much, let's say, especially given that the content of every phone call was corrosive criticism. And so one of the first things we determined that might be helpful was that we could limit those conversations to once a week and if they were unpleasant, that she could just hang up. And that caused quite a storm, as you might imagine, because it had been going on for a very long period of time. But you do find people who are being tormented to death by someone who purports to love them, in, in which case, sometimes the only solution is to set an extraordinarily firm boundary. And, I mean, I've seen other people, many other people in my clinical practice who were trapped in unbelievably destructive familial situations. And sometimes perhaps the best route out of that was to establish a certain degree of independent existence and to put up some boundaries which is really what you do when you become an adult anyways however i would also say as a rule of thumb it's pretty damn brutal to sever family ties you know i mean it's a last ditch attempt if you have to do it hopefully what you can do is engage in some pro process of reconciliation and 
and that's a better pathway forward. One of the things I've been very heartened by is that many of the people who come to my lectures, who I meet afterward, have told me that as young men in particular, but often young women, and sometimes mothers and fathers, but it's usually the children who say that they decided to make a conscious after effort to rectify their relationship with their parents, to face whatever disuniting obstacles are fragmenting them and to work that through and to try to do that in a spirit of gratitude. And it's often lovely to see that because very frequently the son who's done that or the daughter will come with the parent with whom they've reconciled. And that's something great to see, man. And so that's a better pathway than, than separation and isolation, that's for sure. But, you know, in individual life, the devil's always in the details. And so I hesitate to say any more than that. And maybe that's a good place to stop. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for you, the audience, for this incredible night. And thank you very much, first of all, for you, Jordan Peterson, has been an inspiration for us for a long time. This is a page form from the Bible printed in the 16th century. You can see it here, it's very unique. And this is a present from you, for you from the people of Israel here in Israel. Thank you. One of the phrases here on the front side is in Hebrew, in the book of Mishlei, tapuach zahav v'maskiot kesef. It means in Hebrew that you look at something and you see something nice from silver, but in, 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 inside, over the silver, you can see gold. And that's the depth vision that you gave us. So thank you very much, Dr. Peterson. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much for this unbelievable event. Thank you very much. And to you, Ben, this is from Shira Shirim, from another book by King Solomon. The last paragraph of Shira Shirim, Kerem Ali Shlomo Beval Amon, and I hope you will have your own vineyard here in Israel. <laughs> and the Bible and the Tanakh is part of our heritage. But not only the people of Israel, but the world heritage. And we hope that one day, Mitzion Tetzet Torah, not only in the spiritual individual way, but how to run a country. And we will learn from the world. And we will learn from you. And we can improve our state. And we can make the world a better place. Thank you very much, both of you. Thank you so much. And I, and I will say that um, I made this mistake before, so I won't read the translated lyrics of Shir Hashirim on the air. <laughs> and thank you very much for Ambassador David Freeman. And thank you all for coming tonight. And thank you for the people who made this unbelievable success tonight. And I hope this is only the first one out of a variety of events that we will have with this unbelievable intellectuals. Thank you very much and good night for everyone. Thank you. Thank you.